Good morning. You know, I don't know that, that uh, there's ever a time where I'm not impressed with the Lord's wisdom and the way that he organizes things and what he instructs us to do. Um, I've told you from long ago that there was a time where I didn't see the value as much in singing as maybe some other elements of our worship. And uh, this morning I'm reminded of how God knows better than I do on things. Uh, I'm a little tired this morning and I was just thinking about the power that singing has as opposed to other forms of teaching and admonition and getting us engaged and getting us involved. And that works best when people are engaged and involved uh, collectively. That's the way the Lord intended it to be. And I appreciate your efforts in doing that. That was an encouragement to me this morning and it helped me. And so thank you in that. Uh, recently, I was listening uh, to a YouTube review of a book, and it was a book that was, from what I could tell, it seems like its main theme was to encourage the American Christian church to be more engaged and involved in the political aspects of our nation and culture, and to stand up and to make change before it is too late for the direction that our nation is going in. And as I was listening to this book review, I was thinking, wow, that makes sense. They had a very compelling argument going back and looking at in uh, Germany shortly before World War II. And the author was making the point that, you know, that was the time when the German church could have made a difference, could have stopped the evil that was, was, was coming from the Nazi party, but, but they didn't. They, they sat back, they were too reserved, they didn't get involved and look what happened. And I thought the author was, was making, at least for me, he was making some convincing points as, as, as he was going through there. And that's one of those times where I was getting caught up in the, in the thinking of the author. And I stopped at the end and I thought, okay, so what, is, what does God tell us about the role of the church? And that's an important step. When you start listening to something that seems to make a lot of sense to you, that, that is very... Um, uh, maybe emotionally driven in a way, it's important to stop and say, all right, what's God revealed about that? That's what God gave us this book for, is to remind us his will on things. And it reminded me of how important it is that we go back and we understand some principles that are given in the scripture regarding, well, what God's will is for his church. You know, we've been talking about for a while now, this idea that Christ is head over the church. He's the boss. He gets to say what the church is going to be involved in and what it's not. He's also our individual boss, and we kind of need to really understand what he expects of us as individuals, what he expects of us collectively as his people, as a church, and what, what does he expect of our involvement in uh, political things and, and, and a number of different areas. So I want to try to deal with that this morning and talk about that, and I think this will be helpful in just kind of framing some discussions that we may have about our role individually in, in, in politics, but not just in politics, the, the church's role in different aspects of uh, our society and different work that God's given us to do. So when you think back, our forefathers seem to put an emphasis on the idea of there needing to be a separation between church and state. And I think part of that was because many of them had just come out of situations where they had seen where church and state were not distinct entities, but they, they were kind of combined together, and that became very oppressive for them. And so they had some personal experience and seeing some problems with the combination of church and state, and so they emphasized the separation of church and state. That doesn't mean they didn't think that they were both ordained of God, because both are ordained of God. Both are from God's plan. In Romans chapter 13, just the chapter after what Jackson read for us, it talks about the fact that, that every soul is to be subject to the governing authorities in verses 1 and 2, for there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. The government is ordained by God. Now, Paul was writing that in the time of the Roman government, which was pretty corrupt, and he could still say that of them. That would be true of the United States government. That would be true of, of any government. God ordained that those type of entities be in place. And we've been talking about the idea that in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus said he would build his church. Obviously, that's ordained. 
of God. That was in his intention and purpose to do that. But I think what the founding fathers understood is the biblical principle that although both are ordained by God, they function in unique ways. They don't, they don't necessarily have the same function. They don't have the same purpose, and that's important. And it, when people fail to realize that, I think they get into some of the problems that the forefathers had experienced with that. So in Romans chapter 13 and verse 4, concerning the state, it says, For he is God's minister for you to good. For if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Here's what it says. For he is God's minister to avenge, to ex uh, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. That's what God intended the function of the state to be, to be a minister, an avenger, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. But God's intention for the church in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, the church of the living God is the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, what happens when the state takes on the role of being the pillar and ground of the truth? And they go out and they say, all right, we're using our power and our influence to say, you need to believe this. You know, there have been times where that's exactly been the case. Uh, you look back in the history of Christianity, and there will be times where there were different political forces, different government entities that would maybe conquer or force all of their citizens to convert to Christianity. I think we talked about some of the, uh, some of the cases we were going through church history and looking where, where there would be a, a king or a leader who would take his army and drive a bunch of pagans into the river and as they came out the other side, there would be a priest there blessing them, saying, you're now Christians. And uh, I think that's, that's a case where the state got confused and said, okay, our role is to be a pillar and ground of the truth. That's not the role of the state. And then there have been times where the church has decided that its job is to be an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And so they felt like it was their job to go out and, and to make sure to punish anybody who wasn't doing what was right. And so you have, uh, you have times where different governments, mostly backed by the, the Roman Catholic authority on that, the Holy Roman Empire, so to speak, had intense persecution, torturing people, executing people for their moral beliefs on different things. And, uh, and, and so we see... The problems there that can, can take place when we don't understand the unique function of, of each uh, organization or institution as the Lord intended for it to be. But the individual Christian does have a role in each. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through 15, Peter tells individual Christians, Submit yourself, therefore, to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governments or those who are sent as those who are sent by him, for this is the will of God. So we have a part in partaking and participating in the state. We pay our taxes to support the state. We obey the laws. We submit to the, to the decrees. We participate in, in, uh, in, in functioning, and we want the state to do well. It, it's God's institution for us for good. And so we do participate, that, participate in that, in trying to support the state in that as individual Christians. And certainly we have a responsibility to the Lord's church. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, Peter, as he describes individual Christians, he said, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So there's this picture that I'm part of this great temple that's God's church. And you're part of this great temple that's God's church. And every Christian is a stone that makes up this temple that worships, worships God. Now, as I'm talking about the church, first of all, let me, let me do some disclaimers here. I recognize the church is not a building. I put that up there as an icon for us to identify with. I also realize that in this lesson, I will be using the term church, and sometimes it will be referring to the church as in Christ's body universally. Sometimes it'll be talking about a local church like Quinn. And so I'm being a little bit loose with the terms for the sake of, of this, because I think that it, it applies the same uh, in the points that I'm trying to make in this. But I, I realize I'm not being as careful with my language in this particular lesson as maybe I would be in some other lessons. But 
the individual Christian, I have a responsibility in the Lord's body as a whole, but then also in this local congregation to participate in that. And yet the function of the, uh, of the church and the function of the state are, are different from one another. And, you know, we could put another in this as well, the home. God intends for the home to function in a certain way, but the function of the church is not necessarily the same function as, as the uh, home. So the government, the home, the church, uh, we are involved in all of those as individual Christians, but the responsibilities of each are distinct from one another. That being said, I do think that our faith plays a part in that. Uh, in, in our political situation, where we are allowed to vote and so forth. I think when I go to vote, my faith plays a part in that. That influences my vote. When, when I go home to my family and I try to provide for my family and the way that I, I head my household, my faith directs the way that I do that. Certainly as I worship God collectively together with you this morning, my faith is part of that. So it's not that somehow our faith is detached from these other. No, our faith is involved in all three of these. It's just that all three of these don't have exactly the same function and the same role. And so just because an individual Christian with faith participates in all of these doesn't mean that all of these can just be swapped around to serve functions that God didn't intend for them to function. The reason that this is important is because as we as we said, we could look back at some cases where when the state thought that it should be doing the work of the church or the church thought it should be doing the work of the state, that was disastrous. But I'll say this, when the church thinks it's supposed to be doing the work of the home, that can be equally disastrous. And that's maybe more common in where we're at today. Uh, in talking about the difference in the work of the church and the work of the individual, I think it is important for us to realize that when we're talking about the church, obviously we're talking about individual Christians working together collectively. The term church is, it, it, it's, it, it's a plural noun. It has the idea that, you know, like when you talk about, um, when you talk about a flock of sheep, when you talk about a herd of cattle, you're, you're, not, you're talking about them working together as a unit there. And then you can specify and say, but that sheep, and you make a distinction in that individual. When you talk about the church and you talk about the individual, you really are talking about two different things. And I think this is shown in a number of passages. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, the church's work involves every member because we're all part of that group. We're part of that collective noun, the church. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 12, as the body is one and has many members, but all of the members of that body being many are one body, so also is Christ. When it's talking about Christ's church, it says, what makes up Christ's church? All of the members, all of the individuals that belong to Christ make up his church. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16, for whom the whole body, joined together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Here's the body. What's it made up of? Of every individual that's making its contribution to it. However, the individual's work may not involve the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14, for in fact, the body is not one member, but many. There's a distinction there between the one member and the collective members working together. And I think that that's seen in several different examples that we have. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul deals with some problems in the church in Corinth, the collective group in Corinth, and what they're supposed to be doing collectively as a church, they're intermingling some things that they should be doing individually in that concerning the Lord's Supper. And so when he talks about them, he, he starts off and he says, you know, when you come together as a church collectively, what you should be doing is you should be partaking of this memorial, remembering the Lord's 
body, remembering the Lord's blood, remembering his death and your participation in that. That's the work that the Lord has given the church to do. But that's not what you're doing. What you're doing is you're coming together and you're having some type of meal where you're eating, one's eating to excess, another one has nothing, one's drunk. And that's not what the church is supposed to be doing. And he uses some terms here to make a distinction. So he says in chapter 11, verse 22, to the individual Christians, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? In other words, Filling your belly, satisfying hunger, or if you're eating as just a social meal, that's to be done at home. That's an individual act. That's not what the church is supposed to be doing. He goes on to say in verse 33 and 34, Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. As the church, this is what you're supposed to do. But if anyone's hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. Satisfying physical hunger or a social meal, that's that's individual. You do that as an individual. That's not the collective work of the church. Remembering the body of Christ, that's the collective work of the church that needs to be focused on when you come together. So you see that distinction there. I, I think we see that distinction in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus is giving instruction. If someone sins against you as an individual, what is the responsibility? Well, the responsibility, Jesus says in verse 1, is, or, or Jesus says in verses 1 through 17 is the passage. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That's not the responsibility of the church at this point. That's your responsibility as an individual. You go and talk to him, you and him alone. If he listens to you or he hears you, you've gained your brother. If he will not hear, take with you one or two more. It's still not. The responsibility of the church at this point. But by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Now it becomes the responsibility of the collective group. But if he refuses to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen or a tax collector. Do you see the individual responsibility there? And then later, the collective responsibility of the church. That distinction is important. In doing the Lord's will, you have an individual responsibility. At some point, the church may have a collective responsibility in that same issue, but it doesn't start off that way. Uh, one other example, and to me, I think maybe because it's detailed a little bit more, it's one of the clearer examples. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul is dealing with the responsibility that individuals have to care for their families. Again, this is an area where there can possibly be some overlap in this. But we have to be careful not to just automatically overlap this. And so he goes through and he talks about there are things that the individual has a responsibility to do that the church should not have a responsibility to do. In verse 4, If any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. The individual has the responsibility to care for their family, particularly their parents. If they have aging parents, if they have a parent that is a widow or a widower, they have a responsibility to take care of them. That's, that's God's will. Verse 8, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Individual is held responsible there. Verse 14, For this I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, and manage the house, and give no opportunity for the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now, I think in this case, what it's talking about is here is one, and they are in a situation where they are in need. Their husband has died. But they're also in a situation where they can do something for themselves. Well, the church should not be responsible in that situation. The individual should be responsible in that situation for taking whatever course of action is necessary in order for them to provide for themselves there. Verse 16, do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number. And not unless she's been the wife of one man, well reported of of good works, if she's brought up children, if she's lodged strangers, if, she's wa if she has washed the saints' feet, if she's relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. This seems to be the case where here's a person and they don't have anybody to care for them. 
We know it's the responsibility of the family to do so, but they don't have family to do so. Should the church step in at this point and take them on as a, a, a take on the responsibility of the individual and carry for them? And Paul says, not unless it's a special circumstance. And he gives qualifications there. She should not be taken into the number unless. And then he gives these specifications. And he continues uh, in, in, in verse 16 to say, I'm sorry, I, I, I've got a little bit out of order there. In verse 16, if any believing man or, uh, has widows, let them relieve them and do not let the church be burdened. Do you see the distinction there? That individual, take care of them, don't let the church be burdened. Now, the idea, well, is there a time where the church should be burdened with that or have that responsibility? Yes, there may be. That's the situation where no one is there to care for them. And it, again, it's very limited. Otherwise, if someone else can care for them, let them be. If they can care for themselves, let them care for themselves. The church does not need to take on that responsibility. Individuals take on that responsibility, whether it be family members or, or the person itself. But under certain circumstances, when there's no one else, very limited widows that meet these qualifications, in that case, the church may take on that responsibility. Well, there's no one else to do so. And so a widow indeed may be taken to that. But then you look at verse 11, refuse the younger widows. Well, let me ask you this. The church has the responsibility to say, I'm sorry. We cannot take on this responsibility. We cannot be burdened with this because the Lord's not, not entrusted that responsibility to us. Can I say that? If, if, if my mother is a widow and I say, I'm sorry, I can't take care of you. You're not, you're not under, you know, you're not over this age and, uh, and, and you haven't met all these qualifications. No, it's clear the individual as the son, I have a responsibility to my mother to care for her that the church would not have in that same situation. So there is a distinction there. And Paul makes that in and, and that phrase that the church may not be burdened is telling because what it tells us is God says, I've got a responsibility for the church and I don't want the church burdened with all of these other responsibilities that I've given to individuals to take care of. And if we get that confused, what ends up happening is the church can't do the work that it was supposed to do. And then sometimes individuals don't end up doing the work that they're supposed to do. So looking at the principles that are given in God's word is very helpful for us in understanding what God wants done. And let me again, as I started off saying, God's way is best. Even when we think, well, I think it'd be more efficient to do it this way. No, God's way is always best. And so this principle, I think, is helpful in that. So let's think about uh, one area, since we were talking about the area of benevolence, the Bible speaks a little bit more of that, the responsibility of the individual in, in benevolence. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 that we just looked at, it's clear. The individual has the responsibility of caring for those in their own family. They have the responsibility of caring for their children. They have the responsibility of caring for their spouse. They have the responsibility of caring for their parents. In James chapter 1, I would say the individual has a responsibility much broader than that. In, in James chapter 1 and verse 27, it says this, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Just my orphans and widows or fatherless? No. Those that don't have family to help, you and I as individual Christians have a responsibility to step in and help them when we see somebody in need. And I think about in Luke chapter 10, where Jesus tries to answer the question, well, who's my neighbor? Who am I responsible for loving? Who am I responsible for taking care of? Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. And what is the message? What's the answer? The short answer to who am I responsible to care for is whoever you have an opportunity to help. It doesn't matter if they look like you. It doesn't matter if they're blood relation. It doesn't matter if they're a different race. It doesn't matter if they're part of a group that you're enemy. You have a responsibility. Individual Christians, we have a pretty broad responsibility when it comes to benevolence. We're to care for those that we see need help and we have an opportunity to 
to hell. But look at the responsibility of the church regarding benevolence, because it's a little different. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 34, we see there very early on that as people became Christians and they became part of the church, that there was a need there. And in verse 34, it says, Nor was there any among them, talking about the Christians in the church there, who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they were distributed to each one as anyone had need. Now, I realize this was a special circumstance, an immediate emergency that maybe wouldn't be there in other times. But the apostles felt like it was the church's responsibility to take care of their needy. And the church, the, the members of the church responded by giving and it being distributed by the church as anyone had need. So the church has a responsibility in benevolence, but in this case, it was benevolence to its own, among them. In Acts chapter 11, we see benevolence being extended out at least beyond the local congregation. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 27, it says, In these days came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch, one of them named Agabus, he stood up and he showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples there in Antioch, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. And this they did. Now notice what happens here. Here's a congregation that hears about, hey, there are Christians in another place and they're really suffering. It's going to be hard on them. And what did they do? Well, let's help them. And collectively, it seems that the brethren there did so, collected that together and sent it to the brethren in another area. So here's another example that we have of benevolence, care for needy brethren in other places. But then as you continue to go through, you're going to see benevolence come up a number of times. And just notice that every time that benevolence comes up when it's the church's responsibility, it's always with needy brethren, with saints that it's extended to. How is that different from the individual responsibility? And let me, let me try to put this in practical terms. I'm at Walmart, and I see someone, and they come up, and from everything that I can tell, they have a genuine need there. I don't know this person from anybody, but it, it seems like they have a genuine need, and they need help. Maybe they're asking for grocery money or or gas money, and I realize judgment is involved in this, and I, I believe that's a real thing. I know some people think you just give them money and don't ask any questions, and I don't, I don't object to that, but I also say I think that sometimes you can look at a situation and say I don't think that's the wisest thing to do, and, and I think that's okay too. But do I have a responsibility if I see a person in need that I don't even know who they are to help them? Yes, I do. I need to, I need to use my judgment in the best way, whether that's handing them $5 or buying them food or whatever it may be, I think I have a responsibility to try to do something to help that person if I think the need is genuine. Now, someone comes to the congregation. They're not a Christian. They come to the congregation and say, hey, I need help. Does the church have the responsibility to help anyone and everyone? Now, there would be a lot of people who say, well, of course they do. If individual Christians have the responsibility to help anyone and everyone, then certainly a group of Christians together have a responsibility to do that. But that's not what I see in the Scripture. Every time that the church was involved in benevolence and helping, they were helping Christians. And someone says, so you don't think that God wants the church to help the world as, as a whole? Here's what I would say. I don't think that that's by accident that the Scripture makes that point. I think what God is saying is the church has a work that I've assigned it to do. And it needs to be careful not to get caught up in every other good work that may be out there because it has a function. And if it gets burdened with all of the other good works that are out there, it can lose its function. And I see the wisdom in that when I think about it. And here's the reason why. Because we see this happening all the time. Well-intentioned. Good motives. People begin to forget about this principle in the scripture and start to say, well, anything that God would give the individual Christian a responsibility to do, 
then the church as a whole has the responsibility to do. Well, what does the individual Christian have responsibility? Well, they have, they have a responsibility to help anybody they have an opportunity to help. So what do they assume that the church has responsibility to do? Well, help anybody they can, they can help. And so churches begin to form world hunger relief organizations and, and, and clean water in Africa organizations. And there's all of these efforts, good efforts. They're accomplishing good things. But I would just argue and say, that's not what the head of the church said the church is supposed to be focused on. Collected. They open up hospitals. Individually, do I have a responsibility to provide an education for my children? Yes, I do. Well, then the church should have the responsibility of providing education for children. So they open up schools. As an individual, do I have a responsibility to provide recreation for my family? I think that's part of living and functioning. Yes, I do. Well, then the church should have the responsibility of providing recreation and social engagement. And so what do they do? Well, they form a lot of things. And there's gymnasiums and there's dining halls and there's, and, 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 and it goes well-intentioned. I understand completely where they're coming from. I think we've just missed the principle that's in the scripture. And someone would say, well, I don't see where that makes that big of a difference. I think it does make a difference. I think it makes a difference going all the way back to that point that we made when we started this series. Christ is the head of the church. So we look to him and we say, what do you want us to be doing? And he said, here's what I want you to be doing. And so we rightly divide, which means it's possible to rightly divide. We look at the scripture and we say, all right, what do you want us to be doing as individuals? And let's make sure we're doing that. What do you want us to be doing collectively? And let's make sure we're doing that. And I think that that's key. Because if we forget that, even if it's with the best intentions, then what ends up happening is we start getting involved in a lot of other things that burden us to the point that we forget what we're really about. Now, let me make one other point. If we're going to say, you know what, we don't have the responsibility to open up and, and operate some type of, of, of organization to try to provide clean water in Africa. That's not, that's not the function that the Lord's given us to do as, as congregation. We, we don't have the responsibility to, uh, to build a gymnasium and provide recreation. That's not the responsibility that the Lord's given us to do. I, I think that that's right. But then what do we need to do? But this is what the Lord's given us the responsibility to do. And we're not doing these other things so we can focus on this, not so that we just have less, less responsibility, but so that we can focus on what we really need to be doing that the Lord's instructed us to do. Lord willing, next lesson in this series won't be next week or in two weeks or whatever. Whenever we come back to this subject, we're going to try to look at, well, what has the Lord said? As the pillar and ground of the truth, this is what I want you to be focused on. This is the responsibility that I've given you to do collectively as my people, as the church. And let's make sure we put our emphasis and efforts there. So this principle, this idea of recognizing the individual Christian as it participates in, in the state, as it participates in the whole, as it participates in the church, understanding that there's a distinction in roles between these these different entities that God's put in place and our involvement in them as an individual Christian and how our faith affects each of that is pretty important because we're letting, we should let all of that be guided by Christ in looking at the principles that are there. And when we do that, then the state can function as it's supposed to function and we can function in the state as we're supposed to function. The home can function as it's supposed to function and we can function in the home as we're supposed to function. And the church can function as the way, in the way it's supposed to function, and we can function in the church the way that it's supposed to function. God gave Christ to be the head over all things to the church. And we respect that authority. Now, what has he told the church to do? I'm not going to preach the next lesson in this series, in this conclusion, but I will say this. 
One of the things that he's given the church the responsibility to do is to encourage each other to be faithful to him. To strengthen and to edify and to build up and to help each other to be faithful to him. Our assembly this morning, we teach and admonish in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We collectively go to our Father and make our petitions known before him. We raise our voices in worship to him. We together remember the sacrifice and the covenant that has been made for us in partaking of the Lord's Supper. And we admonish one another to say, hey, look, if you need spiritual help, we're here to help you. That's our function. That's our goal. So I offer this exhortation to you. If you need spiritual help, let that be known right now. And let us function the way that Christ instructed us to function, to help in whatever way we can for you to be faithful to the Lord. So if that's something that... that you need to do in your life, this is a great opportunity because that's one of the reasons why we're here. So if we can help you spiritually, please come while we stand. While we stand. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.